in the lecture series. The theme of this year's lecture is the public realm. As of 2019, approximately 84% of the US population lives in urban areas, up 20% from 1950. This increasing density can have dramatic positive and negative in impacts. The Bay Area is one of many urban regions that are struggling with transportation and housing crises. We have a glaring socioeconomic divide yielding greater physical segregation. Yet research shows that the more we engage with people who are different from us, the more creative we become together. A diverse community is better equipped to develop successful solutions to complex problems that fuel evolution. Cities are truly the incubators of innovation and the public realm is the great mixing chamber where new ideas are conceived. We have purposely invited talented designers who are shaping our urban cultural centers and the open space that surrounds them. Before we begin, I wanna thank Dave Lennox, university architect and director of campus planning, Zach Posner, director of architecture, Padma, Padma Kudidapudi and Diana Lynn for organizing the series. I would also like to thank the American Institute of Architects Silicon Valley chapter for their help in advertising the series and registering our program for continuing professional education. At the end of the lecture, your attendance will automatically be noted and submitted to the AIA. Just a, a quick note that the lectures, the past lectures and, and next week, this lecture will be on the YouTube channel um, and linked via the lecture website that you found this link at. Protocol for today's webinar, please use the Q&A section to post any questions you may have during the lecture. We've allocated 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the lecture for Q&A. The moderator will group similar questions together and will present them to the speaker as time permits. Thank you, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Laura Cresimano. Laura Cresimano is founder, co-founder and leader of SiteLab Urban Studio. Laura is an expert on urban design and entitlements with an emphasis on the public realm and social power of space. Designing both processes and places, Laura's projects range from Pier 70, where she led a multidisciplinary team through the design and community process for a 35 acre mixed use waterfront development in a historic industrial district in San Francisco. She's also leading the design for Google's first proposed mixed use neighborhood located at their headquarters in Mountain View and is designing pop-up care villages for the homeless services nonprofit Lava May to help them provide mobile showers as well as radical hospitality. Prior to forming Site Lab, Laura was an associate at Gensler. Her research on the future of work and the urban impacts of the corporate campus has been published in Spurs Journal, The Urbanist, and she has taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the California College of the Arts and at UC Berkeley. Laura earned her BA from Yale University and MR from Harvard, where she received the Alpha Rho Chi Medal for Leadership and the Julia Amory Appleton Fellowship to study public space and protest in the 20th century. Please give a warm Stanford welcome to Laura Cresimano. Thank you, John. Oh, so I'm honored to be here and to be final in this series on the public realm, which is a really great prompt for, for these lectures in architecture. I enjoyed listening in on a few of them, particularly the most recent one from Julie Eisenberg. And I can say what I will be sharing today will carry on the same themes, but a bit of a jump in scale um, and hopefully a different or new vantage point. Let's get this, let's make sure I'm working here. There we go. So recla reclaiming vision is something we do together. First, I'll start with a little background. I am co-founder of Site Lab Urban Studio. Um, I began in 2012 uh, Site Lab with my co-founder, Evan Rose. You can see here on the left, who passed away in 2015. Today, we are a team of about 20 um, designers, a really diverse, great set of people. Um, and we started Site Lab with a shared desire to design for people to think about how we use spaces and what they can do for our communities. And particularly to work at the intersection of design disciplines, architecture, landscape architecture, inside, outside, horizontal, vertical, interiors and mass scenes, public and private, quantitative and qualitative. In a word, what I consider to be urban design. As we practice it, urban design is all of these things. It is setting the bones in two dimensions and three dimensions for urban life and for the unfolding of place. 
So I'd like to first talk about the why for myself and for our work, and then I'll share a few projects and open up for Q&A. Um, first for me, um, I did not know in school that this is where I would end up. I mentioned I studied architectural history as an undergrad. And after working for a few years, I went to Harvard for my master's in architecture. And I assumed I'd actually become an academic. Um, while I was at the GSD, I maybe not surprisingly did not feel like I fit in. Um, I did not feel like I fit the mold. And rather than focusing on studio at the expense of all else, I spent a fair amount of time involved in the politics, either outside or inside the school, and challenging what I felt was a focus on an elitist way of practicing and talking about design. Even my thesis, which you can see at the bottom right, eschewed a building in favor of red customized Winnebago's for civic action. I was lucky to get credit for my thesis and even get nominated um, for the thesis prize. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned, it was a little bit of a hard road for me, frankly, in grad school. Um, but I did find a handful of kindred professors like Margaret Crawford, who is now on the West Coast at Cal. Um, and one of the things I studied with her was why architecture felt so disconnected. And I could give a whole lecture on this, but instead I will give a very short reductive version, my version of history here, um, and highlight one aspect, which I think is the turn inward that has happened over the last century in architecture. Early modernists had ambitions for architecture and design to address social problems of society. And regardless of if you agree with their proposals and efforts like the Villa Reduce shown here, that there was that impulse to engage. As modernism came to the United States, style was applied more than substance. And there were clearly failures. In the best of cases, like the liver house, they were elegant but anti-urban. And in the worst, they were defensive and dehumanizing. I suspect that those failures were part of architecture's inward turn. It seems that architects suffered a crisis of faith about what we can influence and responded by displacing our own agency on formulas, jargon, and system-driven processes. This narrowed the field of vision toward disciplinary problems. At least this was the dominant theme in my design education. So at Site Lab, we embrace the messy complexity of it all. We choose to turn outward, to focus on looking and listening, and to make plain and accessible what we learn from others, what we learn so others can join in the debate and the process. And I should note that before Site Lab, I never thought that I would start or lead my own practice. And I think in large part that was because I didn't believe that I fit the hero architect role. But what I didn't realize then, and I know now, is that I didn't need to fit that role. Site Lab is built on collaboration and curiosity on a diverse team that questions what is possible. And here you can see a few images of the team at work, at least um, pre, pre this past year, um, and what it has looked like this year, um, where we've made the most of, of working remotely. Um, our model of collaboration extends beyond our internal team. Almost all of our work is in teams with uh, talented architects, whether it's Heather Studios in London or David Baker Architects in California or landscape architects like West 8 in Rotterdam or ecologists like San Francisco Estuary Institute. And even more importantly, with cities and communities, we want to learn about places from people who know them, who have a stake today and tomorrow. We want to learn the nuances of a place, but also build relationships and opportunities to connect so that the proposal that we create is not ours at the end, is a result of many, many voices. Working this way is unpredictable and challenging at times, um, but it's also in my mind, the antidote to the generic, to the universalizing. And I put this slide in here, this image of a London plane tree, because it's something that has stuck with me that our ecologist friends pointed out to us, which was, they had a concern that this tree, the London plane tree, nothing against it, but has become the default street tree in cities around the globe. And this means that, not, that these streets may not just look the same, but it alters the range of biodiversity in our cities, limiting the variety and authenticity in each place. Another example to the right is the woman with bag. Um, 
this is in the entourage that we use. It's easy to default to what we have, um, folders of these entourage that we pass around. But the same set of people can't be represented as if they are any person. And we wanna think about that. So at SiteLab, we try to resist the default. We try to draw on place specifically. Some people in um, our field talk about place making, some talk about place knowing and place keeping. All of these are good terms um, and practices, whether they be about the ecology, the cultural or the material history of place. We believe that place is specific and that it's co-created. In fact, co-created again and again. And we are invested in design as that, as a social practice, uh, as an invitation to participate. And so we've been working this way and creating vibrant places, you know, like you see in New York. And of course, then suddenly it all changed. Um, the ground shifted and what we thought we knew, um, what we thought we had control over turned upside down. Even the divide between urban and wild blurred. This is an image of a mountain lion uh, roaming through downtown San Francisco among the towers. Um, and if, and it, and maybe that created some space. For us, fortunate enough to be healthy, we reconnected with the joy of a public park, the simplicity and intimacy of each circle that we could occupy. And maybe at the same time, we had more capacity, sorry, more capacity to question the status quo, to believe that things could change. And if we weren't getting the message, we had days like this in, or a day like this in September, where the color of the sky itself couldn't be taken for granted. I'm sharing these images, not because I have answers um, or because our work suddenly changed, but first because it happened <laughs> and it's hard to not acknowledge. And two, because it reinforced for me and I think for the team at SiteLab, the need to keep questioning, to keep looking and listening. This is in fact core to our work. Often, Designers come in late in the process, and I should give credit to a professor of mine at Harvard, Marco Steinberg, for this, these charts. The idea here is that in many cases, the architectural brief is far from defining the problem and is the last mile to the solution. We are interested in getting closer to when the problem is being defined, to moving upstream, to identifying the right questions to lead towards better solutions. This is our approach at the big picture scale as well as the day-to-day -day work. And the focus at the end of the day is not contained to a discipline of architecture or landscape architecture, but really public life and how all the pieces that we shape physically and through the process itself can create that platform for public life. So that is the context and a little bit of the motivation behind our work. And now I'm gonna talk about three projects and the still unfolding vision for each. First, Pier 70. We were very fortunate as a firm to have this as one of our first projects. It's shown here in the dark orange. It's uh, 35 acres on the Southeast waterfront of San Francisco. Today is in fact a construction site, but before that, this is what it looked like. Um, largely fenced off and accessible and many great historic industrial buildings falling into disrepair. Next to a creative eccentric neighborhood called Dog Patch with artists and makers and um, a mix of industrial and uh, residential and a great group of people. We were lucky for this project um, that the developer had the vision to not start with design, in fact, but instead to start with an artist. And so Wendy McNaughton was brought on and given independent license to spend a month in the neighborhood drawing and talking to people. And this is an image of what she produced out of that. Um, many of these people we got to know uh, quite well. And some of her drawings and the themes that we heard really carried and shaped how we looked at what is possible, what was possible at Pier 70. So the idea that the dog patch was the original mixed use neighborhood, um, it was one of the themes that carried throughout. We also had the good fortune to collaborate with the developer and a whole team of people to think about creating place before any new buildings were built. 
So the, these are images from events that took place at Halloween, um, craft fairs. Uh, and in all of these, we looked for opportunities while people were enjoying the possibility of experiencing this place to share more about the vision and to get their input. And so this here is a site tour um, in the early days. This, I think, as well as the just the quality of the site created a really vibrant mix of people that were very engaged in the place. And I will say that we, you know, we learned a lot from all of them. We didn't always agree with everyone, but it created a lot of um, engagement and stewardship for the place. And I think everyone aligned around a vision that spoke to what could root this new place here. And so that was a relationship to the dark patch sensibility, the industrial history. This is a national register historic district and the opportunity for a new urban waterfront. What that means in terms of the plan and the design um, was starting first from the historic buildings. Building 12 here is a incredible warehouse, essentially, it was a ship repair facility that will be uh, more of a maker market hall and is an anchor at the center. The first big move was instead of just having a waterfront park lining the edge to take that and pull it back into that center with the historic buildings and continue it extending back all the way to the neighborhood to respect and extend the existing street grid straight to the water and then start to develop that sense of creativity and place around the park and those historic buildings with residential and creative uses. And as you see there with a star, with a new building that'll be dedicated to cultural and arts uses at the waterfront as a kind of new twin to the historic building 12. And then filling in around that office uses or potentially residential, depending on how things unfold. These once upon a time were created as a buffer to the active ship repair to the north and to a power plant to the south. Now to the south that is similarly on its way to becoming a new extension of the neighborhood and these two projects will be connected and the waterfront park will extend. And then of course, getting to that finer grain on the ground to have those activating uses that are indoor and outdoor and that sense of scale at a, at a finer human grain. Behind that kind of abstract drawing were thousands of massing studies to work out how to shape the building fabric and how to deliver the housing the office and the retail industrial. And for a project of this scale, this one is 35 acres, the process is not to design each one of these buildings all the way. Um, and I should say that this project is a collaboration that was led, urban design led by Site Lab with um, James Corner Field Operations on the Landscape Architecture, Grimshaw contributing, as well as David Baker Architects, among others. Um, so that work was not to design every single building, but instead to set the rules that we could agree to in terms of how to shape the place that is an agreement really a legal agreement between the city the community and the developer um, and in this case public private with the port and the developer so this set the standards for how anything could be built and what it needed to respect to deliver that vision and traditionally zoning or these kinds of standards can be a bit one size fits all you know you have to step back this much at this height. We also resisted that and said, that's not enough to really make the great place that we want and respond to the specificity of this place. And so the standards that we wrote have an array of scales and speak to both the public space and the ground floor conditions and are different depending on where you are in the site. If you're next to a historic building, next to the waterfront, each different location has a different nuance. We also built into it and this is working closely with Grimshaw Architects, a bit of a choose your adventure for architecture, which is to say we didn't want to prescribe or pre, you know, pre-mandate the rules. And instead, we wanted to incentivize an investment in shaping the buildings and particularly in materiality. And so there was a bit of a toolkit here where you have to do a certain number of these pieces. And it was in particular to incentivize materiality because of the qualities of this place. Um, because of what we observed there and because really how we it was so important to, to not ruin it to to embrace contemporary architecture and the creativity and have that embrace the principles of what 
was already there. And so you see these some kind of eccentric moments even, or the compression between the two, building 12 and building two on the right. And then here an image of the future um, that is underway um, with that maker market hall to your right, a view to the water and the new public space with new residential on the left, or a view from the new continuous waterfront um, and bay trail to the residential coming up to that edge. Here you can see building 15, which we um, established as a gateway of sorts. So that, that line of 22nd Street that comes through, we were able to preserve this building and strip it so that that street continues through but that moment of entering the historic district is really recognized. Um, and in fact, you can see here, the project is currently under construction. Um, and in order to build that street, because they have to build the new roads, they actually had to haul building 15 over out of the way. Um, and once the road is completed, they will be hauling it back. Um, but the project continues not just in terms of being built, but in terms of the spirit of collaboration and the partnerships. And this is something, you know, I this is not our work, we can't take credit for it, but it's we're so excited to see how the developer has continued that ethos. And here you can see images from in particular a series of interviews highlighting the amazing creative people in the neighborhood um, and the artists around to continue to foreground them and build those relationships and partnerships for the future. The second project I want to talk about is a little more hot off the presses. This is the Downtown West project in San Jose. It was actually last week um, unanimously, amazingly unanimously approved by the city, San Jose City Council located in downtown San Jose uh, next to Deerdon Station. Um, most of you probably know the area. Um, interestingly, located in between this major multimodal station, it's already a major station and it will be even more with the addition of BART um, and high-speed rail, but also at the confluence of the Los Gatos Creek and Guadalupe River. So really interesting urban and natural location. Um, and 80 acres, so a, a substantial um, new extension of the downtown. When Google came in with this, like having bought this land partially from the city, um, and we began on the project, there was a lot of legitimate fear um, and a lot of real issues, which continue um, around homelessness and gentrification and fears about what, what Google what this would look like and how it could change um, San Jose. I think that most people thought that Google would do this um, and create really a closed off campus, um, but that's not what we wanted to do. And the good news is that's not what Google wanted to do. Um, and I think key to this is that the first step was listening to people and, and listening in really simple ways, asking them what excited them and what concerned them before we even talked to them about what it, could look like. Um, and we heard a lot of different themes, um, whether it was about affordability and opportunities in education or how to retain the sense of culture and diversity of San Jose. And so this project really undertook a paradigm shift for the way a tech company could enter into a city and a place. This is basically the opposite of what we all read about Amazon in New York. Um, and it was a shift from the sense of an office campus to a real mix of uses from thinking about it as an island to thinking about it as built on connectivity, from thinking about this land as a tabula rasa for design to anchoring it with what's there already, from vehicle dependency to the public realm and people first. And from choosing one or the other urban or nature and thinking about how we can bring them together. So those experience drivers for us were the experiences of the creek, that access to the transit hub, the local fabric, all of that together with this addition to create a real mixed use connected extension of San Jose. What that meant in terms of the framework plan that we proposed um, and will be implemented now. And again, this one is quite a was a very intensive collaboration 
working with Heather Rick Studios out of London and West 8, um, and a number of ecologists and engineers, and um, eventually also Grimshaw Architects and KPF, and Fougeron Architects and SCVs, quite a lot of people. Um, first, we start from what is there and what is working and what is not working. There are barriers that are created currently by the rail um, and broken links in the experience of the creek and the trails. So our first step was reconnecting those links and creating better continuity um, and opportunities to connect with bike and as a pedestrian. Then we restitched the grid. Um, previously north of Santa Clara, where the SAP Convention Center is, um, really felt like a back of house. It was like over there. And so connecting the streets through and creating the opportunity for a variety of experiences on each of these streets, which are further emphasized by a series of open spaces that move from the gateway moment of coming out of the train station to a center core with a civic building to Creekside, across the creek to starting to move into downtown. That series of open spaces was complemented by a whole network, in fact. Um, instead of delivering one singular open space in one part of the site, we created this network that could have a range of experiences that related to where they were and what their adjacencies and the character of place in those areas were. And so that from any neighborhood nearby or from within the site, you're never more than a few minutes from one of these parks. We also rooted it around historic and existing buildings. So each of those open spaces is anchored by one of these buildings. Some of them are in fact historic. Some of them are in fact, truthfully, kind of crappy sheds. Um, but we think that they are important as part of, I'm sure I offended someone with that, but that's okay. Um, they're part of creating that diversity of place that it's not all new, that it's not all making the most of density, um, that there is that kind of eccentricity through keeping some of these existing buildings. And they also are located adjacent to the creek. So it was part of also minimizing any interventions near the riparian corridor. So you see here that sense on the ground in those existing and historic buildings and the sense of the pink being the kind of active uses that are all affiliated with open spaces. And then you see here a moment, and this is, I can do my annotate button right here um, along Santa Clara, a kind of gateway moment. Oh, no, I messed things up. There we go. Where you have a historic building on the left, which will be devoted to uh, nonprofit and educational uses, and the new, a new Google office building on the right, where the ground floor similarly has space for an event center that can be shared um, nights and weekends for community uses. And the beginnings of partnerships like you're up um, nonprofits that could be located on the ground floor. If you basically turn around and walk two feet from that location, you find yourself at the creek. Um, and here is where those smaller buildings and sheds get converted. Park spaces are created in between them. Um, there are already partnerships starting to um, bring local groups like Valley Verde into these spaces. And the idea of really embracing the native ecology and giving more space for it and giving ways for people to learn more about it. Altogether, um, you see it in three dimensions. It is a sizable project. There's over 7 million square feet of office being proposed and 4,000 units of housing. Um, key to this, as I mentioned, was that it is all of the office is not all aggregated together in one zone that is closed off. Um, it is distributed. It was actually particularly a strategy to put along the rail so you could get kind of larger buildings and floor plates without feeling that straight up against the neighborhood. And then each kind of sub-district, let's say, or zone here has a little bit of everything as open space, residential office, and uh, retail and active uses. The residential meets the existing residential of the neighborhood and steps down. Um, and it, you have a network of pedestrian and bike paths throughout. So you can see here how we worked with the, the uses and the typologies to create a sense of a very skyline, um, even while creating a really dense project. Um, and similar to Pier 7, this project, you know, 
you want to be able to design it all, but you can't for 80 acres. And it also can't be a single building process. So we worked very closely with the city and with council members and various people in the community to talk through how this could work and what those guidelines and standards are to help ensure that vision um, and the commitments. So it ranges from everything from standards around the architecture to the streets and to this transformation of a very robust vehicular network to a vehicular network that works but doesn't prioritize the car and instead rebalances. And I think in any if a, with, a, with a theme of public realm, the streets really um, can't be overlooked. The streets of any place in all of our cities are probably the most extensive network of open spaces we have. And so that is a core part of stitching it together. But it's not only about design. And while our focus is design, we supported the work and we're really excited to witness what Google and Lend Lease, their development partner, were doing in terms of connecting with local organizations and developing a platform for programs that were not top down, but were coming from grassroots and partnerships. And this slide is one that usually Google talks to, but I wanted to give you all the context of the larger project that the design sits within, which is this suite of commitments, um, whether it is 25% affordable housing or in this case, a very groundbreaking model of a community stabilization fund of $150 million that will be allocated by the community, not by Google. Um, local job opportunities, uh, programming in public spaces, uh, no net new greenhouse gases, and a real commitment to both sustainability and ecology. And we got there, frankly, by the wisdom of so many different people and so many different engagements, and by being challenged um, at every turn by people who were skeptical um, and wanted to make sure that they were being heard um, and that they were able to look out for the continuing what they loved about San Jose. Um, and so that led to, I think, a really different model um, and a different experience, truthfully, than I think I've had on any projects. Um, some of the comments that we received to council, we had, you know, it was unanimous and there was a resounding sentiment that was really quite moving about feeling heard and a part of creating this place and a part of its future and being empowered by the way that the overall project has been structured. Um, and that to me is kind of like, it, it just kind of doesn't get better than that um, and sets a really high bar of responsibility for how the next phase plays out in the, um, and this project is built. And so for the immediate next step, um, we are excited to support the, some of the local groups that are already on site um, and pair with that. On the right is a map of a walking tour with viewfinders that will be um, available. And this is late June will be that to start to give people a sense of what's coming next um, and start to, to build um, opportunities for these local partners on site and hopefully learn from them um, about what's needed for the future. And then the last project, um, is Lava May. Um, as John mentioned, we have worked quite a bit with Lava May, and I will say that um, I learned from John Peterson, who's founder of Public Architecture in San Francisco, the idea that for architects, instead of spending your money on marketing and competitions, find a problem or a group that you want to support um, and, and do the pro bono work for them. And that's a way better use of your time and will bear um, fruit in a partnership and in, um, I think, a, also just the kind of fulfillment of it. And so Lava May is, has been that group in many ways for us and in fact happened just because the founder gave a talk and I was moved and went up to her um, and asked what we could do. And um, what I part of what I was moved by was their model for radical hospitality to not just do what was necessary or think about their services for survival, but think about dignity, um, think about the people they serve as guests and clients um, and provide a lift for them. Um, 
our first thing that one, you know, we offered to do for them is they said, we have this idea of a pop-up care village, but we don't know how to explain it to people. We need an image. And so we worked with them to understand what they envisioned, sketch out this image. And then particularly they had a lot of photography that they had permission of different people that they had served. And so we put this image together just to speak to this idea of it's not just mobile hygiene, which is what they started from the showers, basically first showers and uni buses. And it's expanded since then to a pop-up care village, which is kind of a merger of homeless services and an off the grid, off the grid kind of festival. This was hosted outside the public library. Um, and the first one was pretty scrappy I and mean, they were all pretty scrappy. We were literally out there with blue tape and, you know, holding down the signs with water jugs, um, but looking to give it a sense of celebration, um, a sense of something happening that other people passing by were curious about, um, and applying really all the same principles and thinking that we applied to projects like Your 70 or San Jose. How do we organize this to have a great experience? How does we make this function well? How do we make this beautiful? Um, and how do we learn from how it worked? So we workshopped it afterwards with all of the different service providers to say which what could we rearrange and where were the pain points? And we provided a volunteer's guide as well so that they could do it on their own and do it with people who maybe were just showing up for that one day to help. The result, and this is just from that first year, was almost 9,000 guests. Um, 10 of these villages that are, you know, have been done in many different places now. Um, and they even did surveys, right? To find out like, how do you feel when you leave here? Would you? would you suggest to a friend? Um, out of that work, and I think one of the points of this is for us, urban design or our work is not purely about buildings or a certain outcome and product. It's about how we can support and shape the kind of healthy growth of, and you know, equitable and sustainable growth of our cities. Um, and so our work with Lava May turned into more, um, I guess these are like how-to guides. Um, and so we helped them think through how they could share their model with others. They realized that scaling was not, that they would have a bigger impact by teaching other people how to do what they do than trying to be the ones themselves doing it in, in different locations. And so they wanted to capture it and not just capture literally, here's how you design the bus, but here's how you do this. Here's the questions you have to ask yourself. Here's, you know, the support you need. Here are the, you know, here's the permitting you need. So everything from the practical to the more um, human, I guess. And the human was a big part of this design, in fact, for this um, toolkit, which was that we decided that the hand uh, line work and really an emphasis on photography was key to it. And this was, so this was a toolkit for the mobile hygiene which then as a result of that, um, just this past year, we then did a toolkit for the pop-up care village for more people to take that on in different forms and scale that. Um, and that is all together on a platform that they, um, that they built to create a way for people to connect, um, people interested in doing this, whether they wanted to do it themselves or find others that were doing it and volunteer. And so you can see that there've been almost 5,000 downloads of the toolkit, which is kind of an amazing reach. Um, and shaping, shaping change in our environments, even if we're not building anything um, in this case. So to close, um, I think of our work obviously as centered in design, but going outside our lane, um, going outside the boundaries of traditional design or architecture, um, and trying to connect the dots and finding other experts and collaborators and voices um, to bring them together to see more opportunities. And I would really encourage you, particularly this any students here, um, to embrace kind of your inner misfit where you don't fit in things and to engage and ask questions and look for ways to connect. Um, and you know, I don't have the, all the answers and I regularly have to reckon with what I can and can't do and where we fall short. Um, but the you know, but I'm humbled by the opportunity to continue doing this. And I'm also inspired by other 
people I see out there charting their own course. And I'm just going to close with three people I admire to send you to go, go look at as well. Um, Aaron Salazar and Local Color is a nonprofit in San Jose that produces and promotes public art. They've been really inventive and amazing at finding space for artists, coming up with programs for arts and public spaces, and even youth education and involvement. And this is really, these are just people, I'm in their fan club, um, and I want to share with you Liz Ogbu, who I believe is taught at Stanford and Studio O. Um, she is really a design shapeshifter, I think. Uh, she works across scales on social justice and participatory approaches to design. And lastly, Konkuli Design in in Initiative, um, led by Chilena Olbert. Um, they are a community development and design nonprofit, and they work everywhere from, I believe they got their start working in Nairobi, um, but have projects also locally in Southern California. And with that, I will end um, and open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Laura. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, nice to see you again. Hello. Thank you so much. That was sure. amazing. I, there's something about this year's series. We don't know if it's because it's Zoom or it's the topic, but we seem to be getting really interesting, different um, lectures that are less about just showing off the old pretty pictures, which you could get on the website anytime you want, um, but really hearing your story about you as a person, as a professional, the vision for your firm, your approach, your process. And it's, it's, to me, it's so much more rewarding. I think a lot of our team has been really thrilled about the results. So thank you for, for going through all that. My pleasure. Um, and I'll remind everybody, please go ahead and use the Q and A uh, section now, if you have something you want to ask Laura, and I'll try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, I want to start off with a big one, which is, I, I feel like the, the stereotypical architect's approach for ages was this auteur thing, right? This like singular voice. And I'm going to, I know the best solution for everything. And I'm going to convince everybody around me of that. But your approach is so much more collaborative and is intentionally trying to be more empathetic and bring in so many different voices. But that has its own challenges because you've got such a different, diverse group of stakeholders that are clients, um, community members, constituents of all sorts, and, and a lot of times other colleagues in your office, and you're doing a lot of collaboration with a lot of different offices. So yes. can you talk a little bit about um, how to drive consensus among these diverse teams? Yes, um, it definitely is not easier. I think like, you know, design by, you know, decree probably is easier in certain ways. Um, that model never seemed really true to me anyways. Um, and I just think you miss out on so much. Um, so what I would say is I, you mentioned empathy. I think it's probably a huge part of being able to do it successfully is being willing to genuinely listen. And even when you disagree or are frustrated by the other parties, um, being focused on what you do have in common and being focused on your common goal of making the project better. And I think that, that the majority of our um, collaborations and work with community members, that has been clear. And I think we have to, you have to bring your own humbleness to it that you don't have all the answers. Um, but I also would say, I don't know that it's all consensus, right? I think we do need to own our expertise and make our, you know, advocate for what we believe in. Um, and then there are choices. Sometimes we make the choices, sometimes, you know, it's the client, it's the city um, and others, but we're very, we spend a lot of time trying to be transparent about decision-making and about the, the pieces of the puzzle so that people can all participate in the conversation. And it's not just like, do you want mine or do you want theirs? Um, are you picking me or someone else? It's more that like, here are the trade-offs, here are why we value this thing. Um, and I think it's, you know, I've, I've read that, you know, innovation, a healthy amount is like collaboration and competitive competition. 
are both necessary ingredients. And I think that's true of our collaborations as well. But yeah, they're I, uh, collegial at the end of the day. Yeah, but I, there, uh, at times you got to butt heads and that's just part of it. And you get the best results out of it when people both dig in and, and have their strong opinions on things. Yeah. Um, all right, an easier one. Who, how is the, the, team, um, the team for Pier 70 pulled together? That seems like a really interesting, interesting diverse team. Did the, the client have that vision? Um, I think that it was a, I don't know that they had that vision. I think that there was a mix of things that happened when we started it. It was, we were a three person office. So they had faith in us and part of that was Evan's, Evan's um, background. So we were very fortunate for that. And so by virtue of us being such a small team, we were not a one-stop shop. If you went to a larger firm where all of it was one-stop shop. And I think that that was an appealing idea, which is something that we promote in all of our projects, which is that like there's a benefit to not one-stop shopping this and let's bring in multiple voices. And in fact, then they really liked that idea of actually embracing the competitive quality of it, right? Like we'll get the best ideas, we'll get exposed to different things. And so we actually did work with the client to, to build that team. Um, and, you know, they interviewed a whole lot of people to choose um, the core team of the, you know, that phase was us with Grimshaw, Baker and Field Ops. Then we had a later phase where it was a little bit more kicking the tires and we brought in Kennerly Studio, um, Kennerly Architects and, and Fugeron to test out some of the buildings and the guidelines and help with the imagery. So come up with their ideas based on these rules, which was a great kind of fresh perspective as well. Um, a couple other small ones about your practice. How many people do you have working with you right now? This very moment, I believe we're 18 going on 19 or 20. And that's, that's like the biggest you've been the it last is. few years, We've right? We've covered around 18 to 20 for the last year to two years we grew quite fat like we we had a kind of I feel like we've had is it logarithmic I don't know what it's called but it's like where you keep doubling yeah we've had that kind of doubling growth so it wasn't you know doubling from two to four is one thing and then all of a sudden you double from 10 to 20 so we have had quite a bit of growth in the last few years and are you is, is your team very diverse also in terms of their training and background and licensure or are you are you finding a lot of urban designers that are just cut from the same cloth as you um, well, I have my own, I mean, my cloth is like, a. I don't know, architecture meets humanities meets, I, there's all kinds of other things, you know, running around studying protest spaces. Um, so yes, I would say they're cut from that cloth in the sense that they often have like a dabbling of different interests. They are predominantly either having a master's degree in architecture, landscape architecture, or urban design and city planning um, with varying degrees of kind of experience from that or combinations they are in of those. Um, we do look for people that are able to cross over. So it's not siloed in our office where if you have an architecture, if you studied architecture or trained in architecture, you only do the buildings related work. Um, everyone kind of puts on all hats and that's what we're looking for is like curiosity and engagement. Um, and I would say our team is very diverse in other ways as well. Um, they are, I don't even, I don't, I know we have at least eight countries represented. I can't even count how many languages. Um, and it's a real, I think, point of pride for the whole team. And we learn from each other quite a bit. Yeah, when you, I, I loved when you put that photo up of the Zoom of the whole team and you could just see it's as, as diverse as you could get. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so, for adaptive reuse, this is very interesting to me. You know, Ju I think you saw Julie Eisenberg's lecture last week, and she had this great project, which was um, a, Car a Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, yeah. which she somehow convinced the client to restore half the building. And oh, wow. you know, and I, so much of your work is starts with this early idea of anchoring place with authenticity and some mm -hmm. eccentric, weird old industrial thing that's there, some remnant and, and really anchoring the neighborhood instead of bringing in all brand new stuff. Um, I, I imagine that's part of your process. Is it really hard to sell a client on that because it, it sometimes could be more costly than just starting fresh? Yes, it is 
hard sometimes. I mean, Pier 70 was easy because National Register Historic District will do that for you. I would say certainly like the San Jose project, it was not a given that we would keep everything. And it was, that was a real conversation. And it was really about convincing people about the quality of the place and reflecting back to them what they want, like what we were hearing they wanted of the place then led you to that conclusion. Um, and then there was, and truthfully, it was a um, triangulation of like, now let's also assess what you're giving up. It's actually not the best place. You know, some of those existing buildings are not the best place to put new office buildings. Like you don't wanna put it right in the riparian edge, you know, like, so there's, we basically try and build up our logical argument of like how you can thread the needle and that this is a win-win. Um, and, but it does, um, it can be, it can be hard when, it, the drive is towards efficiency and things are expensive. So I understand that. And we try and look for like, how can we trade, give you something super efficient over here to get this? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you have questionnaires for the community early on and sort of suss out what do you see as a landmark for this neighborhood? What's, what are the touchstones for you here um, that you would really love to save? We do not, I wouldn't say we have like a formalized methodology, like a standard questionnaire, but I think we do always ask what like what's most important to you here what is like how, like how do you describe this place to other people where do you recommend what do you like, yeah i think touchstones is a good word so we do ask a lot of questions about like how people see their own neighborhood um and what they would want us to know about it yeah i mean it believe it or not we actually have a million different opinions about the stanford campus and what what the most important spaces and buildings and landscapes are to people is everybody's totally different yeah. and their the image of stanford in their head is yeah. the only one right yeah um, do you have any early i want to talk about the the impact of pandemic on the public space um and also on your office your office park work for lack of a better word mm -hmm. any early ideas um in conversations with google about how uh, post-pandemic, uh, yeah. more tele telecommuting, all of that is going to impact their project and your more civic projects um, that are really about active public spaces. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak for Google and their, what they're going to do, um, but what I understand, I mean, they're, they're committed. And what I understand is, well, I think there are two things. They were needing to grow at a pace that was like hard to keep up with. And I think that's a Bay Area issue and, and an issue in many cities. It's just like the the demand. So even if the demand were to slacken a little, I don't think that that means we don't still need and build offices. I think that there is a rethink that will happen about what role the office plays, um, how it is more like serves the social collaborative side of work more explicitly. Um, and then there's more flexibility for, you know, the, the more kind of individual contrib contributor work. Um, and I think that's a, an interesting thing for what that means for our neighborhoods. Like, are you, does that change what we want in within our walk, you know, the kind of 15 minute city or the micro neighborhoods and what kind of, are there satellites or other ways to divide people resources? How are we supporting people in their homes to be able to work? Um, these are in fact all questions that I'm asking myself as well for our office. Um, <laughs> as we think about what is a flexible model. Um, I want to talk about placemaking for a second. So uh, I, I can't remember which project it was, I'm sorry, but th there was sort of these images of people running booths and um, farmers markets and things yeah. like that. And it's probably Pier 70, yeah. Yeah, when, whenever we do these kinds of projects with, with active placemaking, um, I find that the hardest part is to keep it all going after we leave as professionals, right? Because there's, you have to program it and it has to remain programmed and be owned by somebody after you walk away. Um, so what strategies have you taken on to, to try and get that across to clients and, and build in the programming so that it takes yeah. on a life of its own after you're gone? I think that's like a key thing is first talking about it. Like, are, do you want this you have to create structure around it. This isn't, you know, and I think some developers it's brand new and some developers get it and they're, they've are they already been in a certain kind of operations. You know, they have like, maybe it's a bit of property management 
but some have shifted to like, there's also a kind of place management that's different than property management. Um, and there's value in that for them. And so I, you know, but we do ask that question, like we can paint this picture, but like what, you know, when we have discussions about like, well, okay, if it's about the ground floor uses, like, is that need to be a revenue generator, which is gonna dictate what's gonna go there or not? Cause we don't wanna draw things that aren't gonna be, isn't realistic. Um, and so there are those kinds of conversations. And then, you know, I think we also look, there are groups, I think there is a market for this of like groups to help be that bridge to help with operations. There are some like, it's, it's a slight difference, but I think like MJM, who manages public spaces or also Biederman Ventures, which kind of came out of managing Bryant Park in New York and does Salesforce. Like, I think there are some groups that are starting more in the public realm, but I do think there's um, more need for that, for people to build expertise around how to actually maintain that. And it's not, it's an indoor and an outdoor proposition. I, I have a question here from uh, an anonymous attendee that I love, which is, NIMBYism is a powerful force in the Bay Area, definitely the case. Have you had success in changing minds from this segment of stakeholders? And if so, what strategies and approaches are most effective? Um, I've definitely been shot down. <laughs> um, I think our success has been, I mean, I think our, our success has been when we can really talk to people about what they're worried about. And so if you can unpack, well, is it that, is it like, is it about change? Is it about traffic? Is it about your view? Like, you know, and I think that that is, um, we try and get at what is the issue and can we solve it in some way? And then the other part is I think that there are, there are a lot of people that are trying to think through the trade-offs and are kind of in the middle and depends on, you know, and I think we focus on like a lot of those people to say, okay, you're not all one way or an all another. Um, how can we like explain the, like what this, how this could benefit you in this place or this city, um, make it more sustainable or, you know, provide more, access or more housing. So I do think we've seen, there is, as much as there is NIMBYism, there is quite a rise of whether self-proclaimed DMV or just pro like housing. Um, I do, I do, I am seeing more, um, more and more of that. Um, I'll just last one. So you talk a little bit about storytelling. Um, that's a big part of our work too is you know, crafting a narrative around something that is at the end of the day, it's, it's space, right? It's re and it's really hard to come up with a new one every single time. Um, how do you extract the kind of, you know, core identity of a neighborhood when you've got such an inherently diverse group of people coming to you with their ideas and their thoughts and their values? How do you kind of distill that all down and say, this, this, is, this is what this group is really about, what this neighborhood is about? I mean, first, I would not, I would not claim to be able to extract the essence, right? I, you know, I think also, I think it's essences. Um, and a lot of it is reflecting back. So we ask a lot of questions and we try and listen, and then we share it like incrementally. So we share it with one group and like get, you know, people will be like, that's not us or no, right? Um, so I think some of it is that, some of it is trying to step, step up a level, I guess, of like what kind of like you saw with Pier 70, the themes are so high level, right? Like, but it was so important to, to name that, the like, that this is a convergence of these three different things and it is not gonna feel like anywhere else in San Francisco. Um, and so I think some of it is like not trying to, I think trying to be specific, like this, something that doesn't, isn't true of other places, but also allowing it to have a kind of openness to be, to have interpretation and to like reveal itself as details come in and as people add the details to it. So uh, you started by talking about feeling like you were a bit of a, a different 
different mm -hmm. person in school and and clearly that's made you come up with a great trail to blaze for yourself so any advice for young graduates about uh, that that may feel similarly that there's not a logical yeah. place that they slot into the workforce and and you know believing in themselves mm -hmm. i mean one is find your kindred people like at work socially professors whoever um and that will reinforce things i also think I got the advice early on that I had to choose, like, did I want to be a designer or did I want to be more of a, I, they didn't put it in these terms, but it was kind of like, you could be a thinker, you can be like an academic person, you can be a designer. And I don't think that's true. Like, I think you don't have to choose. And I think especially early in your career, like dabble in the things that interest you. And for myself, I didn't know how it came together. I really, it was like really at the point, right preceding site lab was when I started to understand, oh, like I did a whole strategic design project focused on healthcare. Like, what does that have to do with anything? But it had to do with a certain way of thinking. Um, and so it was, so I would recommend that, like just kind of follow your interests and immerse yourself in that and allow time to like then see how you can, where you find the patterns in your own interests. That's great advice. Thank you so much for your honesty and your originality, frankly. Um, I just love that you're just such a unique voice in, in our design community. Um, and it really came across in this whole presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you. And now I'm gonna ask John to come back on screen and take us home. Well, Zach, I think your notion of Laura as an original voice is, is spot on. I was struck by three things. One is your notion of crappy sheds. And I think there's there's something to do with Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. There's a, there's a paper about ducks and decorated sheds and crappy sheds. Um, but more seriously, I think your notion of spending time as a firm that would otherwise go to competitions and portfolio development and all those things and putting them into pro bono is spot on and uh, a real lesson for all professionals and firms. Um, I think that that's, it's wise, it's good, it's uh, kind, and it's uh, the right thing to do. Um, and then I was struck, lastly, we touched on this in the, the last few questions about embracing your inner misfit. And, and I think that that is something that our students and young professionals need to learn is that they need to find their own way in the world. And uh, you've shown one way, it's not the right way for everybody, but you've blazed a path for uh, others to follow and they can branch off and find their own inner misfit. So thank you very much for a great talk and thank you all for joining us for this lecture series this spring.